the ability to uh, model something means that you have gone through the exercise of uh, taking observations, rationalizing them, synthesizing them, and then expressing them in often mathematical terms that can be implemented in a computer. So that process alone of going from observation to uh, simulation already has forced one to better understand what is happening. And then uh, ideally what can happen from that exercise is that you have a tool that can be used as a predictor for uh, how things can evolve. And so I believe very strongly that in the that modeling can be very, very useful to better understand and better manage the physical world as well as the socioeconomic world. And as these our students and teachers and parents are um, becoming modelers this week or delving further into it, do you have any words of advice or wisdom as they try and model um, various uh, outcomes this week? I would say, yeah, don't be afraid to, um, to arrive at the wrong model. Don't be afraid to model something that uh, then th th that doesn't work. You've already learned something just from the exercise of, uh, as I said, going from observation to, uh, to a computer model. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a quote you know, that says that all models are wrong but some are useful, which I think is very true. A model cannot, in almost virtually all cases, substitute the, the physical world or, or, or reality, um, but it can be very useful. In a new study, researchers in MIT's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering used network theory to understand how infectious diseases could spread worldwide through air transportation. Researchers built a model to describe the mobility patterns of individual travelers and derived a metric to rank and predict which airports in the United States would be the most influential spreaders of disease within the first 15 days of an outbreak. In this animation, you can see the daily connecting flights to and from all U.S. airports. Some highly connected airports, such as Anchorage, are powerful regional spreaders. Others, such as Honolulu, owe their spreading potential to their geographic location. The global super spreaders, such as JFK and LAX, combine all those elements. Connectivity, traffic, and geography. Air travel is important not so much in that the exposure is radically different from other modes of transport or even just in daily life. In, it is uh, what makes it special is that long range aspect that comes with it. And the fact that you can very quickly, really in a matter of hours, in, have the ability to transmit one agent from one continent to another. And so as we're thinking about um, stay, how many of us are trying to stay more at home and stay further apart from people, um, from your study on hand washing and transportation, how does that relate to what we're trying to do today by staying at home more? There are different levels of intervention. One, would, one we could say is a long range travel. And there are travel restrictions that can indeed be very effective in that regard. Then there would be a limitations or restrictions that promote the control of the disease within populations. So that would be at the city level. And this is what we are starting with, what really many people are already experiencing in, in what first in Asia, then in Europe, and now here in the United States. Um, there's an intervention at the city level that um, is, uh, whose objective is to just limit the contact. No. And then there would be a third level that is really the level of individual of just keeping a 
um, very stringent um, hygiene protocols, in particular hand hygiene. So it is difficult, and, and of course, each of those categories would come with their own set of possible interventions. So it could be at the city level, could be closing schools, or it could be closing parks, or it could be a more stringent measures, like really shelter in place. Um, so we, but also many other groups around the world are now studying uh, what are the most effective um, uh, control strategies, the, the, most, the most effective interventions, at the, especially at, this, at the city level um, on, on any given population. And it could be different depending on the population. And so are you um, modeling um, various scenarios in order to figure that out? That's correct. So one of the things that we're doing now is in using mobility data, not only at the global scale, but also at the city scale to better understand what is the benefit or to perform sort of a cost benefit analysis from different types of interventions. And do you have any preliminary results that are showing um, certain precautions are maybe mo more helpful than others or that the steps we're taking are in fact helpful? So um, uh, we don't have uh, definitive results um, as, of, as of yet, but I think that the indications are that these containment strategy, strategies, these restrictions can actually be very effective at um, mitigating disease transmission. Wonderful. Um, and when you think about previous pandemics, like I think of the Spanish flu after World War I and I'm sh the Black Plague in the 1300s, how is this similar or different? And um, how did travel affect either of those? Do you have any sense? Yeah, so uh, let's, use the, let's use the Black Plague as an example in the Middle Ages. It took, um, really decades for that disease to go across continents. Now it's taking days. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, long range, long range travel and the global connectedness of our society is what really makes a difference. So I would say that mm, that feature of our society, that global connectedness, uh, both in the physical world as well as in the virtual world has many advantages, but it makes us more vulnerable as, as a society to events in that they can spread globally much more aggressively. Right, and one of the advantages is that um, because things can spread globally, it also means that if another country finds a solution that that can spread as well. Exactly, yes. So, and this is indeed what we're, what we're hoping and expecting, and that is that in, in, you know, as the race towards uh, finding a vaccine or, or, a, or a series of, of effective vaccines for the new coronavirus, as um, that occurs, that would naturally also spread, that goodness would also spread very quickly. So as you think about the situation we're in today and the research that you've done, where do you see hope um, or good things coming out of this? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, there the, the would be good things coming out at various levels. So one of them is the uh, notion of that we have to have more resilient healthcare systems. Um, and uh, this in a way is serving as a very, <laughs> um, a very good wake up call as to what the fragility in our healthcare systems is. And I think we will be better, better prepared or just better off in the future because of it. In the, the other maybe uh, so not as uh, profound, but that is, in, you know, we are using technology to stay connected, 
and um, you know, technology and screen time can have its uh, downsides as we all know and i am the first one who tells my daughter that uh, you know there's no more screen time for for today um, but this uh, you know, the, the fact that we have to rely on it for our communication um, has proven to be i think effective and a good way to well, to substitute to make up for uh, the isolation that would otherwise uh, we would we would suffer. Mm -hmm. okay. And is there anything else you think that we should share with this community of teachers and students and parents as as we think about modeling um, and the power of modeling for understanding what's going around us, what's going on in the world? Yes, and that really have very strong opinions, and that is that the ability to uh, model something means that you have gone through the exercise of uh, taking observations, rationalizing them, synthesizing them, and then expressing them in often mathematical terms that can be implemented in a computer. So that process alone of going from observation to uh, simulation already has forced one to better understand what is happening. And then uh, ideally what can happen from that exercise is that you have a tool that can be used as a predictor for uh, how things can evolve. And so I believe very strongly that in the that modeling can be very, very useful to better understand and better manage the physical world as well as the socioeconomic world. And as these, our students and teachers and parents are um, becoming modelers this week or delving further into it, do you have any words of advice or wisdom as they try and model um, various uh, outcomes this week? I would say, yeah, don't be afraid to um, to arrive at the wrong model. Don't be afraid to model something that uh, then th that doesn't work. You've already learned something just from the exercise of, uh, as I said, going from observation to, uh, to a computer model. And um, you know, there's, a, there's a quote you know, that says that, all models are wrong, but some are useful, which I think is very true. Uh, a model cannot, in almost virtually all cases, substitute the, the physical world or, or, or reality, um, but it can be very useful. 